60 Minutes Rewind. What was it like in that hole where Saddam Hussein spent his last moments as a free man? We're going to take you inside in a moment. But first, we introduce you to the man who got Saddam. Colonel James Hickey has been putting the puzzle together one piece at a time for months. He launched 12 raids against the Iraqi dictator before Saturday night's capture. Today, Colonel Hickey took Scott Pelley to the site of Saddam's last stand and told us about the army he sent to catch a man. About 600 soldiers, lots of tanks, Bradley's aircraft, Humvees, um, howitzers in position ready to provide fire support. Just to capture Saddam Hussein? Well, our estimate was there was going to be armed resistance. You were expecting a gunfight? Absolutely. It won't open. The capture of Saddam was nothing like Colonel James Hickey expected. The eight-month manhunt ended here. Uh, this is it. In a muddy orange grove where the dictator had fallen from palaces to pauper. This is about what it looked like when we got here. Hickey showed us the one-room shack and outdoor kitchen where Saddam was reduced to squalor. He still fancied himself president of a nation, but here he was the lord of the flies. That's happy tuna. Saddam's kitchen. Well, for some time, I guess. He's got his instant coffee, cans of tuna, and jars of beans. And beef luncheon meat. It turned out that Saddam was just a few miles from Hickey's headquarters, the 1st Brigade of the 4th Infantry Division. Secure the site, we've got to basically walk him through. Hickey's the son of Irish immigrants, grew up outside Chicago, and earned advanced degrees in both public policy and diplomacy. But most of his work here has been detective work, hunting Saddam and his high-ranking henchmen. How many raids have your soldiers conducted in the Tikrit area since you got here? Well, the brigade uh, across my area of responsibility uh, has conducted over 500 raids of various types uh, since we have, uh, probably since June, about mid-June. We've been constantly thinking about possibilities. Hickey says there was no luck or magic in finding Saddam this time. It was months of raids and interrogations focused on five powerful families in Saddam's hometown, Tikrit, what Hickey calls working up the family tree. We've identified, you know, five or so families that, that we thought early on were particularly important to uh, um, the security uh, of, of, of number one and their efforts to try to coordinate an armed resistance in, in our area. Colonel, you talk about these, these five families and working up the family tree. It sounds like an investigation of the mob. Clearly, this was a regime that relied on a handful of key families. In working through the bloodlines, Hickey's intelligence officers identified one man in particular, a ranking member of Saddam's personal security team. That man was found last week, and that was the key. The man has not been identified, but he gave up Saddam's hideout. Hickey wouldn't say why the man betrayed Saddam, but within hours of doing so, Hickey's force moved in under cover of darkness, and suddenly the power went out in the village where Saddam was hiding. As good fortune would have it, the, uh, the electricity went out in the, side, in the town of Adour, which further masked our, our approach. Good fortune? Good fortune. How did that happen? It just happened. It just happened because of a special forces team called Task Force 121. The special forces team searched the shack, but there was no Saddam. But then they took a second look. I think they heard a sound initially and uh, pulled back a small piece of carpet. And again, found a small block of styrofoam that was covered with some earth, removed that, and uh, they clearly saw a man down there, and they saw two hands come up by the bottom of the hole. The hole is just at the end of an orange grove right under, under this date palm tree. And it's a hole just the size for one man. I'm going to take this camera down and give you a look at what it's like. And this is it. There's a light right up here, a fluorescent light connected above by an electrical wire. This is a, a concrete wall, looks like about well, it's less than two feet across. And then over here, the same thing, tiny little space with a fan also connected 
by the same wire. And this hole here, this pipe, is connected to the pipe that goes outside and brings in fresh air. There's just enough room, I'm six feet tall, there's just enough room to lie down in here, but nothing more than that. Just a tiny concrete vault, and there's the opening that leads back outside. The floor is just dirt, and this is it. This is the last thing that Saddam saw as a free man. And this would be the first thing that the American forces saw, though in the darkness, when Saddam came out of the hole. He was dressed in a dishdasha, which is the Arab robe that flows to the ground, and he had his pistol strapped to his hip. He was, he was pulled out, and he introduced, according to the, the uh, soldier I spoke to who did it, uh, he said, I am Saddam Hussein, president of Iraq, and I'm willing to negotiate. And the rejoinder was, uh, President Bush sends his regards. Standard operating procedure for a soldier finding a hole like this is to toss a grenade down there. Right. Was that about to happen? Probably. Why didn't it happen? Well, the man, the, the, the man at the bottom of the hole clearly communicated his willingness to surrender. Might have lost Saddam to history at that moment. He may have been history. Saddam was handcuffed, a hood was pulled over his head, and then he flew by helicopter to Tikrit and then on to Baghdad. Come on up. Captain Desmond Bailey of Wetumpka, Alabama was covering the special forces team as they brought Saddam out. What did you think? Uh, first feeling was, you know, is this it? Is it, it, that's all it took to get the old man? I thought he would have gone down more like uh, Kusayan Uday with a fight. His two sons, big right. firefight, they went down shooting. Yeah. We were prepared for direct fire contact, but did not have it, which is not a bad thing. Just that we uh, had expected that, and when it didn't happen, I mean, it's it's not the way we had pictured it in our minds. What did your gunner say? He was the same thing. I can't believe it. This is this is it. Where's the where's the blazing fury? You know. But uh, we we had lost three soldiers September 18th in an ambush and had two others injured. So our, my troop as a whole welcomes the opportunity to close with and destroy those who aim to cause us harm. The story will continue after this. You had been hunting this man for eight months. You had conducted 12 raids in which he'd gotten away from you. Right. When they called you and said, we've got him, what did you say? That's great. Come on. That's what I said. That's great. We began moving forward due north on Highway 24, and I called General Odierno on the uh, secure telephone from my vehicle and told him we had uh, captured Saddam Hussein. What did he say? Well, he, he said, really? And I said, yes, sir. And I told him I'd be up there in about 20 minutes, and I had about, about a million dollars to give him. Among the rags, they had found riches. It turned out to be about $750,000 in American $100 bills. One soldier told us we were rich for a minute. These were the last pictures of Saddam back in April as U.S. forces rolled into Baghdad. This was Saddam at the beginning of his run. The dictator who boasted palaces, a million-man army, and his face on every street corner was reduced in 254 days to a hole for a house, an impotent arsenal, and a face that even after the fall could not be disguised. How are you, sir? It's good to see you. Hello. 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 This morning, Colonel Hickey called the mullahs and the politicians together in Tikrit and told them that times had changed. What is absolutely clear is one simple fact. Saddam Hussein and his criminal regime will not return. Based on intelligence developed since Saddam's capture, the raids are continuing every night. Of the original 55 most wanted fugitives, there are only 14 still at large. 
There has been criticism that the term mission accomplished has been applied to this far too soon. But now that he's been pulled out of this hole, the mission accomplished? Well, this was part of my mission. You know, it was a target of opportunity. And we took care of it. And there's work to be done. And we're not done yet. And uh, we will carry on with our duties until somebody tells me we've accomplished our mission or we've been duly relieved. So that's what we do. Mission goes on. Absolutely.